A very good evening to you. We're about to meet a remarkable woman who has had a unique career. She is the only person who has worked with every single artistic director of the Royal Ballet. Not since the year dot, but pretty much since then. <laughs> she came over to this country from her native South Africa at the age of 14 to join, with the intention of joining the Royal Ballet School. She joined the company at 16, became a principal, was plucked out by Sir Kenneth Macmillan, and in 2002 became the artistic director of the Royal Ballet. There is only one, will you please welcome, Dame Monica Mason. Monica, the obvious way in would be to talk about the very beginning in South Africa and what started you off with dancing, but I thought it might be rather fun to start a little bit later on and to talk about the moment when your dancing career finished and you became a teacher, you became repetitor. Why not a choreographer? Because uh, I have absolutely no talent. Uh, <laughs> To choreograph. It's a wonderful way to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, choreographic gifts are so rare, and um, I think probably quite a lot of people can arrange dances, and um, I didn't even know if I could do that. Did the teaching then come more naturally? What makes a great teacher? I suppose many things, really. Uh, Great communication, I suppose, the ability to empathise, good background training yourself. I think having had uh, strong influences from teachers, I, I, you know, I don't know, I wouldn't have described myself as a great teacher at all. Something Rudolf Nureyev said, you can never be too young when you start teaching. Mm. He said, if you see somebody and you think you can help them, go for it because that way you teach yourself and you discover if what you've said could work mm. and uh, whether that person benefits. How was he as a partner? Because <clears throat> you partnered him as well. He didn't partner much. <laughs> 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 he expected you to stand on your own legs. <laughs> and sometimes the odd word would sort of pop out of his mouth into your ear if you were not on balance <laughs> and you were causing him a little bit of extra energy to be used. <laughs> But what was wonderful about him was, of course, because he was such a performer, such an extraordinary... Well, he was sort of an animal, really, mm. flaring nostrils, and, and he loved living life on the edge. You know, and I've always said that dancing with Rudolph was really like standing on the edge of a cliff in a high wind, because you really didn't know if you were going to go over the edge or whether he'd catch you in time. <laughs> I mean, there, there were some amazing moments. I mean, I have a distinct memory of a performance of Swan Lake at the Met in New York when we were doing Black Swan Pot de Deux. And um, at one point, he's standing downstage in that corner and the ballerina does uh, what we call lame duck pirouettes, on day all pirouettes, dee diddle dee diddle dee diddle dee diddle uh, And he was standing, gazing out at the audience, doing this <laughs> wonderful pot de bras. And at the moment that I took off for the pirouette, he was looking in the other direction. <laughs> it's amazing the speed with which you can have a thought. I remember thinking, this is going to be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I finished the pirouette, and fortunately, I must have been completely on balance, because it was like a whole second later, I felt a pair of hands go <laughs> <laughs> on my waist. Um, it was never dull. <laughs> <laughs> you worked particularly well with Macmillan. You worked, by your admission, less well with Ashton. His work didn't seem to suit you or you him. What was the problem? Well, I was fine when I was in the corps de ballet um, with, with Sir Fred. It was just later on, as I began to do soloist things, I would notice that he always chose other people. And um, he had a preference for lyrical dancers, and I was not lyrical. And, um, but uh, strangely enough, right at the very end of his life, when he was really very frail, I remember him um, coming into the offices at Baron's Court, and Sir Fred was sitting on this rickety old chair, um, uh, smoking his cigarette, of course, and uh, I went in, and I was 
it was so lovely to see him. We hadn't seen him in ages. And we all adored him. And uh, I said, oh, Sir Fred, it's so lovely to see you. And I sat down beside him and we chatted a little bit. And then suddenly he said to me, you know, I'm so pleased I've seen you today. He said, you know, I realize that there are only two members of this company that always send me a Christmas card, and you're one of them. <laughs> and, and I said to him, and a fat lot of good it ever did. <laughs> oh, dear. And so we laughed. And, but in fact, that was the last time I ever saw him. Oh, so. You've made your peace, mm. both of you. What's heaven? Time, I think, to see you in classical ballet. Um, it is Frederick Ashton. Uh, and here we have you um, in Cinderella. Eventually, as happens to all dancers, the career comes to an end, you move on. You became repetitor to Macmillan. You also became assistant director to Sir Anthony Dow. Mm. Um, interesting man to work with, Anthony? Oh, yes, super. Absolutely wonderful. Loved Anthony, still do love him. Uh, I'd always admired him so much as a dancer. We would performed together. Um, in some ballets. Did he whisper anything in your ear like Nureyev, or was it no, quite, no, quite no. different with oh, Anthony? No, quite oh, different with Anthony. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> no, I always think one of the loveliest stories about Anthony Dahl was because he danced with Jennifer Penny a lot. And Jennifer Penny had an absolutely wicked sense of humour. And she and Anthony got on like a house on fire. And there's this wonderful story of how she was often trying to find ways to uh, keep Anthony calm, because I think he was always honest himself about how he how nervous he used to get for performances. He always has said that. And um, there was one night uh, he was partnering Jenny and there was a moment when the sole of her point shoe was very visible to him in, a, in an arabesque and in large letters on the bottom of the sole of her shoe, she'd written, hello, sailor. <laughs> We had a bit of a hiatus. We had Ross Stretton, which was not the happiest association. Mm. Australian, who'd come over here to take charge of the company, left within the year, or it was certainly not much more than the year. What do you think the problem was there? I, I think that it um, was uh, a question of him being only the second person who'd been appointed director as a complete outsider. I think with Ross, he was even more of an outsider in the sense that he'd lived in Australia and New York with ABT. Somehow, I think right from the outset, some of his repertoire choices were not critically well received. He did, however, bring Onyegan to the company, which was a ballet that uh, many people had admired for many years and had wanted. And, uh, and I think probably people had tried previously to get it into the repertoire and had not succeeded. And uh, so that was a, a, a great plus. Um, you know, Ross died a very tragic death. He had brain tumours. And um, I have often wondered whether, even during the year that he was with us, mm. whether he wasn't already suffering. Mm. And um, I got on extremely easily and well with him, I have to say. But then my relationship was different. I was working on Macmillan Ballets. Um, I found Ross to have a really very sharp eye about choosing dancers. He selected some excellent dancers for the company, some of whom are still with us. You as assistant, you then took over as, in effect, 
caretaker while mm. a new director was appointed. Mm. It turned out to be you. Mm. Um, did that happen quite quickly? Did you think about it'll be somebody else or did it come as a bolt out of the blue? What was it like? Well, I have um, I had at the time as assistant director um, um, a little uh, enclosed office um, in the sort of area that is the Royal Ballet offices. And um, I used to feel quite cocooned in there sometimes behind this double uh, glass. And I couldn't hear things and I used to shut my door and get on with my work in there. And, then, and of course I was in the studio mostly. And uh, after Ross had gone, and uh, they, um, Tony Hall asked me if I would take care of the company for a bit. Um, one of the board members came to visit me one afternoon, quite uh, off the cuff, and he said to me, uh, what are you doing in this little office still? I said, well, what, what do you mean still? Uh, he said, well, you're looking after the company, you should move into the big office. I said, well, I, could possibly, I couldn't possibly do that. I mean, you know, that would be so presumptuous and look, quite wrong and he said no 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 it looks quite wrong to the company that you're still in this little room pack your things and move into that so I thought well if a member of the board is telling me to do it perhaps I better do it so did you just refuse to leave afterwards was that how you got the look <laughs> <laughs> well I mean something like that really I got in that office and in no time I thought hmm <laughs> I rather like it in here and then of course there were you know I was so used to saying, when somebody asked me a question, oh, um, I'll have to ask Kenneth, mm, I'll have to ask Anthony, uh, well, I'll have to ask Kenneth. And then somebody asked me a question, and I said, oh, I'll have to ask uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first things I did was to ask the archives if they had some portraits that I could hang in my office. So I hung Nanette on one wall, and Sir Fred, and then Kenneth. So I would have three enormous reminders of, uh, of what, what I was undertaking, really. And um, the one of Ninette is a very unusual photograph. She can see me wherever I am in the office. <laughs> <laughs> Her eyes follow me all around the room. And, um, and of course, I've, over the years, I've sort of chatted to them from time to time. Um, I especially chatted to them when I appointed Wayne McGregor. Because, well, that uh, was very controversial, mm, very modern mm. choreographer. I said to madam, you know, what, now what do you think of that? Uh, the picture Did she reply? It didn't fall off the wall. Oh. So I, <laughs> I think we were okay. We'll take that as a sign. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we should just see a snippet of the thing that Macmillan made your name with, if you like, Rite of Spring. Let's have a look. You must have been absolutely shattered by the yes, end of that. Yes, yes. But there was great pleasure, you know, in being so completely exhausted, especially mm. when you hadn't had to be on point. Yes. <laughs> One of the things I've enjoyed hugely is programming triple bills. Mm. So when I had the chance to program them, I just found that that was one of the best things. It was how, such how a do you challenge. put them together? What, I don't how know. On earth do you decide? <laughs> I don't really know. You, you just have such fun because you've got, sometimes you've got one new work to be programmed in there, and you, you think about the music, and then you think about the choreographers, and uh, there are so many um, alternatives. You know, you can have an entire Ashton evening or an entire Macmillan, or you can mix the two, or. Uh, is there ever a feeling of, well, they might not like that, but then they'll like this yes. bit? 
Yes. So. Oh, I'll put this one in because it's difficult and it's about time they had that one again. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll get to love this one. I know they will. What do you want to be remembered for? Oh, gosh, Alan. I needed warning about that question. <laughs> um, I think I feel very, very blessed. First of all, in ever being given a job with the Royal Ballet Company. Incredibly blessed at having had the opportunity to work and get to know, to work with and get to know as many amazing people as I did. Jerome Robbins, a rehearsal, two or three rehearsals with Balanchine that were unforgettable, all the times with Ashton and Macmillan. And it's just, uh, you know, how lucky can one be, really? Mm. And... Um, and so to have had the opportunity to make a contribution to a great company. I Which think. clearly needs to keep moving forward. You've done your bit for that. What do you think, this is perhaps an enormous question to finish on really, what do you think the Royal Ballet needs to do to be able to get through and develop over the next 20, 50 years? Mm. Well, I think that's, in amongst all of that, is the question is where is classical ballet going to be in the, the next 20, 50 years? Um, you know, gosh, if one had a crystal ball. Uh, I really, I wonder. Where would you like it to be? Well, I'd, I'd love dance, you know, I've, I've often talked about it as dance rather than just ballet, because I think as time has gone on, you know, just to say that I, I have felt during several interviews that I've given as I'm going away from this job, um, and I'm very struck by the fact that I feel that um, I do have a connection back a hundred years, not only because of Rite of Spring, but because of all the wonderful Diaghilev people who came and worked with us in the, in the ballet school and then later on in the company. It all comes under the sort of umbrella of dance for me because Lenos, there's no way you can sort of talk about it in classical ballet terms because it isn't. Really, over the last a hundred years, certainly, uh, ballet has broadened and broadened, and dance has been more and more embraced into that sort of extraordinary family. And that's why I think I felt also the courage to appoint Wayne McGregor, because I thought nothing could be quite as shocking as the first Rite of Spring or that first Fawn or Les Nos, the first time people saw Les Nos and heard that music, you know. And this is not a particularly brave step. This is just how it is. And, and so I think that, um, you know, if dance can go on, can continue, uh, I think the discipline required for classical ballet and the importance of the finest teachers to make the greatest classical dancers. You know, I think that, I feel it's interesting uh, that some of the finest classical work now comes out of China and Japan and some of the greatest attention to detail of classical training is in the Far East. We had something at one time that was so unique, the Ashton and Macmillan. New York City Ballet had Balanchine and Robbins, but we had these two greats, these two giants. When they died, we then knew what it was like to be a company without those kind of kings, those emperors leading us, and you know, and, we're the willing slaves. I always say the, the choreographers are the kings and we're just, the, you know, the king's fools to please them. And so that's why I think for that last triple bill, my seven tearing their hair out choreographers <laughs> all trying to collaborate with one another and these new designers and the composers and everything, you know, that's really what I wanted to say was it's about the future. Mm -hmm. Who knows what it is? We, none of us know what the future has in store for us but you have to go for it, and you have to go bravely into the future. Well, as long as it has you in it somewhere, as the Empress. <laughs> <laughs>
it'll be all right. It's been a delight for us having you in the Royal Ballet for 54 years and as its director for 10. Thank you from all of us for the pleasure of those years and the pleasure tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Dame Monica Mason. <laughs>